action. Um, we are going to start the vigil with reading our equality statement and um, land acknowledgement. If we have community members here, um, welcome and um, thank you for joining. Um, the equality statement, can I get a volunteer to read? I will share the screen. Thank you, Kelly. Union solidarity is based on the principle that union members are equal and deserve mutual respect at all levels. Any behavior that creates conflict prevents us from working together to strengthen our union. As unionists, mutual respect, cooperation, and understanding are our goals. We should neither condone nor tolerate behavior that undermines the dignity or self-esteem of any individual or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment. Discriminatory speech or conduct which is racist, sexist, transphobic, or homophobic hurts and thereby divides us. So too does discrimination on the basis of ability, age, class, religion, language, and ethnic origin. Sometimes discrimination takes the form of harassment. Harassment means using real or perceived power to abuse, devalue, or humiliate. Harassment should not be treated as a joke. The uneasiness and resentment that it creates are not feelings that help us grow as a union. Discrimination and harassment focus on characteristics that make us different, and they reduce our capacity to work together on shared concerns such as decent wages, safe working conditions, and justice in the workplace, society, and in our union. QP's policies and practices must reflect our commitment to equality. Members, staff, and elected officers must be mindful that all persons deserve dignity, equality, and respect. Thank you. Um, if you're not speaking right now, please have your uh, mic muted. Um, and then you can unmute yourself uh, when you are speaking or reading your statement. Um, Ryan Bishnoth will be reading the land acknowledgement. Hello. Um, so we would like to recognize the territory on which we congregate. In New York region, we live, work, and complete this meeting on the traditional lands and territory of a number of First Nations, including the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation and the Mississaugas of the credit, as well as the Huron, Wendat, Tetan, and the Abenake people. This area uh, is in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Abenawe, Mississaugas, and the, I forgive my pronunciation, uh, how Dino Sane, that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and people, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. We all eat out of the dish, all of us that share this territory with only one spoon. That means we have to share the responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty which includes taking care of the land and the creatures we share it with. Importantly, there are no knives at the table representing that we must keep the peace. As union members, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet here. We thank all of the generations of people who have taken care of this land. In doing so, we also pledge our unwavering commitment to continuously honor, protect, and sustain this land. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so we will be uh, starting right now. My name is Dini Sathi. I am the chair for York Region Unit and Long-Term Care. Um, this is a QP905 local uh, wide vigil that we are um, gathering here to remember the 215 uh, indigenous children. 
Um, I decided to organize this uh, event um, as an ally for the Indigenous communities. I am not Indigenous, I am Tamil. Um, we do share very similar uh, cultural practices uh, with the Indigenous community, and I wanted to take away the emotional labor from Jody Fox, who is a signing officer and also an organizing member with BIPOC Collective, uh, who has uh, been um, helping us and guiding me through this. Um, however, in as part of decolonization, we do not want the racialized people to do the emotional labor during these times and as allies that we take on that work and include them as advisors or uh, to get the guidance. Um, the intention of the vigil is to remember the children and also um, allow them to go home asking for their spirits to return home to their loved ones um, and um, for them to find peace. And so we will be doing a moment of silence for two minutes and 15 seconds for the 215 children. And I will be playing an indigenous song during this moment of silence. Please do keep your mics muted during this time. Remember me, remember me when the sun comes up in the morning sky. There I will be, there I will be, soaring with the eagle so high, feeling free. Remember me down the road, hand in hand, you and me. Hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh. Hello, hey, 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 President of the local, Catherine, will be leading a statement. Thank you, Dini. I wanted to thank you for organizing the event today. Um, 
this wouldn't happen, have happened without all of your work. So thank you on behalf of the local. Uh, I speak to you today as the president of Local 905 and as a white settler on this land who is a first generation immigrant. And uh, I've been afforded opportunities in this country as an immigrant that I know um, have not been uh, extended to Indigenous people of these territories. Today, uh, we gather to mourn as a local for the 215 children whose bodies um, were discovered, the 215 lives that were um, extinguished, the families that lost those children forever, and the community of Tukwemlubta, the Wempak First Nation, which is where these children belonged. We've been hearing about in, uh, from Indigenous communities through their oral histories about unmarked burial sites around other residential schools. Uh, we do call these residential schools, but they were actually prisons and places of torture. Uh, these so-called residential schools were part of policies and laws uh, that were enacted in this country and ripped apart seven generations of Indigenous people. No, we've talked about cultural genocide as a country, but I think we need to be clear that what we are witnessing is genocide. Uh, these policies around residential schools were around the systematic destruction of an entire people so that they would not have claim to land that was stolen by a settler colonial society, which is where we live today. And that land continues to be stolen every time uh, we hear of treaty agreements that are not upheld across this country. I think we have a tremendous responsibility as workers and as a union. Uh, we live and we work on this land. We hold responsibility to not only understand this as history, but actually something that's happening today. And we hold responsibility in breaking that colonial relationship and standing as workers with uh, Indigenous communities and their ongoing demands for justice. I know there will be a lot of focus about what actions we can take as a union and as workers uh, moving forward. And so I did want to just bring to your attention the ongoing need for clean drinking water across reservations, the um, need to uphold treaty rights in the face of resource extraction, the genocide of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, calls for funding for education across Indigenous communities, demands for cleanup of environmental contaminants that impact the health of Indigenous people, and finally, the calls for an end to the forced removal of Indigenous children from their families through child welfare agencies. Uh, these are just some of the demands that we hear about today from uh, Indigenous communities. I hope that uh, as we think through these issues and as we continue talking about them as workers and as a union, and that we're able to take concrete actions um, on some of these issues to right the ongoing wrongs. And so I really just want to encourage everybody that we move forward to build together a more just society into the future where Indigenous communities can be healthy and safe and prosper. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Next, we have um, three parents who will be reading a, their statements. And the statements are approximately two minutes and 15 seconds um, to keep our solidarity uh, during this time. Um, and the first statement will be read by Jody Fox, an Indigenous member, and also the organizing member of BIPOC Collective and a signing officer at the local. Thank you, Dini. <clears throat> okay. Ani Ojo Tansi Tanishi Lakut. She got we are getting condition of cost. We come down Jabba, Nigit Dodem. 
My Anishinaabe name is Standing Hawk Woman and I'm from the Wekwemkong unceded territory and I am Otter Clan. I think the original nations and caretakers of the territory in which I currently reside with my daughters in the area of the Toronto Purchase Treaty 13 and the Williams Treaties. It was around this time last year when I started my engagement with the QP Local 905 with my peers. We felt a severe lack of representation and significant absence of action in supporting us as members who were impacted by the pandemic and escalating ongoing racial injustices. I found myself in an environment where I felt alone, where my voice was not heard many miles from my original home. For over a century, children of all ages, as young as the age of three years old, were forcibly removed from their homes their families, their cultures, their lives, for no reason other than their racial background from this territory and from many territories across Canada and the US. Today, I'm grateful for many things. I'm grateful for the messes I clean up daily around my home and for the meals I must cook because my three daughters are home for me to teach life skills to, to make a home for and to nourish. I'm grateful for the piles of laundry we go through each week because my daughters are home to wear whatever they choose, no uniforms, and they can wear whatever they want on whatever adventures they encounter each day. I'm grateful to have to do school shopping, make lunches, help with homework, and nag my daughters to do well in school because they are home for me to support them. I'm grateful for the gas and travel money we spend attending powwows because we're allowed to celebrate our culture. I'm grateful for, I'm grateful to use what little of our language I know with my daughters around our home because no harm will come to any of us for speaking it. I'm grateful to go outside with my daughters to wait for the school bus or drive them to school when they miss the bus because I know they will be home in a few short hours. I'm grateful for the noise in my home and the nagging children because my daughters are home with me to hug, laugh with, care for, nurse when ill, nurture when hurting. There were 215 children left discarded in a mass unmarked grave in BC. Many more still waiting to be found across Canada. Young spirits who were never afforded proper ceremony when they were taken from this world as their ancestors were afforded. Even more children who survived but were never afforded an upbringing that many of our children would have. Thousands upon thousands of children who survived their institutionalized childhoods without knowing a loving hug, a supportive embrace, nourishing meals, and their own culture and language. Children who were raised in such a hostile and sterile environment and survivors who found themselves bearing children and yet were not shown how to love. My oldest now would be getting ready to finally return home, not knowing how the the experiences she would have experienced would impact her future. My middle child would be about one third of the ways through the system and I'd be wondering every day if she was okay. My youngest would be only starting and I wouldn't know when I'd see her again. Most of all, I'm grateful for our very existence because my grandparents and ancestors before them all survived as they did and persevered the challenges they came across once they returned home. Any one of them could have very easily wound up like the 215 and the other children who have yet to be found like quiet seeds planted, waiting to spring forth our truth for the world today. I say miigwech to the Benojiak who unknowingly lost their lives so that the truth of our history could be uncovered today. And I say miigwech to the Benojiak today for the paths they will lead with the strength and resilience they were born from. I say miigwech to everyone who came out today for showing your support and your solidarity with us and for those who will pick up these messages 
to carry on the actions and work that have yet to be done. There is much work to be done, changes to be made, history to be taught. We need every one of you to speak and act to your friends, loved ones, children, and spouses. Miigwech. Thank you, Jody. Um, next, I have Jenna Dolly, uh, who is the lead steward for York Region Unit and organizing member of the BIPOC Collective, will be reading her statement as a Black mother. Thank you, Dini. So my heart contain, continues to mourn for these 215 children. These are the ones that we know, but we all know that there sadly are, are more. It is a deep loss that has been felt across our country and a reckoning of how much reconciliation work we are all still need to do individually and collectively with and for our indigenous brothers and sisters. As a parent, I reflect on our greatest fears that come with loving and caring for our children. I cry without fail every time at the thought of them ever coming true. From the moment that we love them, our children, we become obsessed with their happiness. Every moment is precious with them, sharing them with kisses and hugs, teaching them and showing them new things to catch, to um, catching them in mischief and watching them grow to tender moments, um, like at the end of each day, tucking them in and holding them tight and reading them a bedtime story. In remembrance of these beautiful children and to stand in the gap for their moms and dads, siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents, elders, and their community. And of course, the children themselves whose precious moments were stolen from them. I'd like to reclaim one of those moments today by reading them a bedtime story as they continue their eternal slumber. I'm just going to share my screen. We sang you home by Richard Van Camp and illustrations by Julie Flett. We sang you from a wish, we sang you from a prayer. We sang you home and you sang back. We give you kisses to help you grow and songs to let you know that you are loved. As we give you roots, you give us wings and through you, we are born again. Our everyday miracle, our everyday smile, our forever home is inside of you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for becoming the best of all of us. We send you home. Thank you for singing back. Welcome to the world. We love you. Sweet dreams and rest in peace. Thank you, Jenna. Um, the last uh, the statement uh, will be read by Ryan Bishnott, uh, a Brown father and a first responder uh, with the York Region Unit Paramedic Services. My name is Ryan Bishnott. I'm a first responder in York Region. I'm a born Canadian with Caribbean roots and I know my history of Canada. I have admiration for Indigenous people. I have respect for Indigenous people. All Indigenous people of Canada deserve great uh, success. This devastating news and the recounting of the residential schools across Canada must have profound consequences for the survivors. To their family and families and friends, I ask you to please stay close to them and look after them, especially now. 215 children who were all new to life were found buried in unmarked graves. 
this is the ultimate act of hate. If we are creatures of God, then we belong to God. So no one has the right to take a life or enslave a life. Indigenous people, you have your own destiny. Like any loving family, we must support each other. I will fight for you and I will be your ally. I fully support my union to allocate resources and attention to indigenous issues and focus our, menu, our members' role in truth and reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, thank you for those statements from the parents. I hope the spirits of the children accept our ceremony. And now we will be sending them uh, home to their loved ones um, with this song. And also this is dedicated to the mothers that who have lost their children due to colonization. Do you know I love you so and mommy will never let you go to the stars and the sky you'll always be mommy's little guy hey oh hey oh hey oh hey oh hey hey oh hey oh hey oh hey 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 oh do you know I love you so and mommy will never let you go to the stars and the sky you'll always be mommy's little guy hey oh hey oh hey oh Hey oh hey, hey oh hey, oh hey oh hey, hey oh hey, hey oh hey, oh hey oh. Do you know I love you so, and mommy will never let you go. To the stars and the sky, you'll always be mommy's little guy. Hey oh, 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 hey hey oh, hey oh, do you know I love you so and mommy will never let you go to the stars and the sky you'll always be mommy's little I hope no family ever experiences the pain that colonization um, leaves us with. And also the intention of this vigil is a call to action, uh, a motion that will be coming forward on June 23rd at the general membership meeting. 
um, for QP 905 to dedicate a page um, on their website for truth and reconciliation and to document our ongoing efforts um, to build the relationship with Indigenous communities and for uh, the truth and reconciliation process as well. So I'm asking individuals who are present today to show up um, at the GMM and support this motion. So we as a labor movement um, do move forward um, with this process and we don't forget and wait for another vigil like this uh, to remember what we need to do. Um, I will now open the floor for any community members and union members who are here that who would like to say a few words. Nina Brown. Thank you, Dean. When we are young, I think our priority is to be able to get outside and play with our friends, watch TV, and then to come back running inside the house and get some food and those hugs and kisses. When this happened last week, at my own dinner table, we talked about this. Like everybody else, the shock, the horror, the unbelievable manner and the shocking way of this type of discovery. And I came across something from my past as a child that was a beautiful conversation that I had when I was growing up. And it reminded me, and I didn't plan on sharing this until now, and it makes sense. When I was younger, I used to visit my grandparents and play with some kids in that area, in that neighborhood. And um, the next time, another time when I'd been there to visit, I realized that there was a young boy who wasn't there. And so I went back a couple of days later to play and I didn't see him. And I questioned it and I said, where is he? And I cannot remember his name right now. But in later years, I found out that that young boy, who was just a child who used to play with me, lost his life in a domestic violence situation right there in the building. Of course, my grandparents didn't tell me that. Well, my grandparents did tell me that in ancient Persia, there was a religion and the people who followed that religion back in the day was Erastians. This is pre-Christianity, pre-Islam. And in there, I don't know if it was scripture or holy books, it was said that when young kids get called to another place, then they get a set of wings. And this is a story that I received from my grandparents. That they now have a set of wings and they fly away and they find this new garden and new play place with some new friends to play with. And that is why, Nina, you're not seeing him here. And he's in that place and he's there with his friends. And for whatever reason, the story struck and I brought it up and I hadn't remembered this in many, many years and I don't even remember his name, but may these 215 children and anyone else who has had to have a fate, a fate such as that, be in that same garden from my childhood that I was told about. May they be free and may they be running there and may they be having new friends and people to love them forever. So I just wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Anyone else? Jody. Okay, thank you for that, Nina. Um, Um, 
um, it would be almost four years ago now that um, my father passed very unexpectedly, very suddenly. Um, and it was some time after he passed that he, you know, when we say, when we dream of um, those who pass, it's because their spirits are visiting us. Um, so my dad visited me one night in a dream. And in that dream, we were at um, our family's property back home at the, the our old um, family homestead, which is an old farmhouse on a hill with a huge field behind it. And I met my dad and he was coming out of the house. And I remember that hug he gave me. Um, my dad actually attended, my parents attended the day schools, um, which were you know, similar in structure to residential schools, but they were allowed to return home each day. But the experiences during the day were quite similar. Um, purpose is the same. My, my grandparents attended residential schools. Um, but my dad came out and hugged me and I remember that hug quite vividly. And off in the back, there were children playing in the field. And he said that, and part of our teachings is that when we leave, we leave because there's a job waiting for us. There are tasks waiting for us on the other side. Um, <clears throat> and that his job, he told me that his, his job and his task where he is now is that he is with the children. And, um, and he said that he was going to go be with this, these children and there were so many of them. And I had a conversation with my six-year-old daughter who still remembers her papa and talks about him quite often. And when we talked about the 215 children, she said that she was, um, she said that these children were lucky because they would have my dad there with them. And I thought, like, the loving father that he was, I'm glad that they would have that. They would be shown the love that every single one of them deserved. Um, and I also want to acknowledge my grandparents for their strength and their resilience. I know um, my grandmother, my mother and my aunts did a day trip one time and we drove by the the ruins of the Spanish residential school along the North shore of the Great Lakes. And um, it's like blood memory, um, residual trauma, intergenerational trauma, but I could feel my skin literally crawl when we approached the property. And my grandmother said to us in the language, um, she pointed to the tree line just off behind the one building that was still standing. And she said that there were children buried back there. There were no fences, there were no markers, but that um, it's always been with me since this was quite a long time ago. So it's been with me since then that there are children who have yet to be afforded the proper protocol and ceremony to return home. So again, the work has to continue. <laughs> There are many, many children still laying in unmarked graves who must be afforded the proper protocol, who must be afforded that journey home in a good way. And, um, and I just ask that we all keep that work in mind. Um, it doesn't end with 
orange t-shirts or flags at half mast, it has the work has to continue. Miigwech. Miigwech, Jody. Sharon? <clears throat> I'm not a parent. Um, I am an immigrant. I'm from India. It was just also a colonized country. And over the last week and really over the last years, um, when you're an immigrant, like you, you hear about Canada and you hear about the white history and you don't learn and you're not given any context or clues about the real history. And that's a history that is steeped in blood and it's a history of genocide. And so over the last week and over the last year, really, um, I've been talking to my mom who's in her fifties um, to kind of help her understand what, what are we talking about when we talk about Orange Shirt Day? What, why is, what is the issue in, um, in Kamloops? Why, why is this a, why is, why, is, what is happening? What is the context? What, what is this great country that we've left everything behind to come to? And now we're finding out the children or burden on Mark Graves and we know nothing about it. And that is this, it's very difficult to explain to somebody who grew up in a colonized country where they have a different experience. My grandmother went to a, a school run by Catholic nuns, by white nuns and stayed there, lived there, worked and that's how, that's how she grew up. My, I went to a Catholic school in India, but we don't have the same experiences. And it's really difficult sometimes to explain to folks that just because we've all been colonized doesn't mean that we've all had the same experiences. Most of us never are cognizant about the fact that what has happened in this blood that in this land that we live in is genocide. It was erasure. It was systematic. It was planned. And that's a really heavy thing to deal with and to learn and to understand. And I think what I've learned over the last year is that we need to call it for what it is and we need to speak about it. We need to teach not just our children, but our fellow immigrants, our parents, our seniors, and we need to be, we need to call it for what it is. I just, I don't have any words. I don't, I don't even know how to start processing. I don't know what to. I see Jody's little girls and it, it, that's, that's what I look at when I'm trying to process this. And it's very difficult. And so to Jody, to her community, to all the indigenous communities, I am so sorry that I haven't done what has what we should have all been doing this whole time. And that's to call white supremacy and that's to call colonization. That's to really start making reparations even as immigrants and settlers on this land. And we're not doing enough. So I'm glad to hear that there's a motion coming forward where we are going to be keeping ourselves accountable. I'm glad to receive these learnings and teachings and to, to commit to independent learning, but we need to do more. And it's not enough that we come into these vigils. It's not enough that we cry. It doesn't matter for, for us as settlers. We need to be doing more reparation work. Anyway, I just, I don't even have words, Jody. I just thank you for your, thank you, Jody. Thank you, Sharon. Anyone else that would like to say anything? In addition to the motion that's coming forward to start the, the efforts and to keep continuing, um, I will be looking for people that who would like to come on board to just focus on the truth and reconciliation process only um, as a team. Um, so then we don't, uh, fall behind or forget that part of it. So if anyone, anyone is interested in working with me on that, um, then please do email me and then I will let you know about the first meeting after
the, the motion passes on June 23rd. Anyone else that wants to say anything? Hello, I would like to say something. Sure, go ahead, Cam. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that this news is um, very moving and um, it affected me. And um, it's very sad to me that news like this has to come up for people to start caring about our indigenous people. Um, and I've been asking this question to some people that like in my personal life that I know are indigenous for some time now. And I'm just wondering to get some, some views from the people in this call right now of what are the next steps we can do as friends and as allies? Is there a way to like, is there like GoFundMe's going on? Cause like, I know there's, there's communities with no running water and that has bothered me for a long time. And I've never understood why that is. And is there some way that we can band together? Cause clearly the government doesn't care. So just wondering. Yep, thank you for asking that question, Cam. Um, so today, like the, the 12th to 1 p.m. is the, uh, the vigil just for, um, for the 215 children. And tonight at the, uh, I think you are from York Region Unit. I think I've seen your name, you're one of the paramedic services members. Tonight, there's an agenda item that is coming to discuss Indigenous History Month, and your unit is also organizing some um, actions, so they will be speaking on that. And then after the motion passes uh, on June 23rd, then we will be putting a team together as a, a, a local wide in terms of moving forward. Um, so like the emotional labor doesn't fall on Jody as an Indigenous member to guide us, because I think the resources and the education materials already um, outside and released. So if you look at the Truth and Reconciliation Report, this has 94 uh, call to action items. So we can pick the ones that members want to focus on first and we can start from there. Um, but paramedic services do have some things that are going on and they'll be updating us tonight at the unit meeting. Go ahead, Greg. Um, my apologies, because I know this is um, it's a, it's a vigil and we're here to, to mourn and respect and honor the 215 uh, children that were found. Um, I also, I kind of felt like I wanted to look at like, what are our next steps as well. Um, so my apologies if this isn't uh, the most appropriate space if we're, if we're supposed to focus more on mourning, because I do want to um, kind of bring to light that um, governments only do whatever like, their the constituents are asking. And so um, all these actions have kind of, they've happened in the name of settler society and trying to access resources and trying to push away people that are pretty much a barrier to being able to exploit what we need in order to expand the economy and move things forward. So really, I think what we need to do is just sort of see it, like what can we do individually in our roles um, to uh, make sure our politicians know this is something that we um, see as being important, that it will be an election issue. We do wanna make sure that they feel held accountable for um, adopting UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration for Rights of Indigenous People, respecting um, our uh, treaties with uh, Indigenous people. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to, to mention too is um, this is a time of mourning um, for the community. It's also, I've seen a bit of light in it too, um, in that we've had members step forward and try to be a part of the change and try to raise awareness and, and move towards campaigns of um, fundraising and raising awareness. Uh, and that's actually let other members in our, in our unit um, identify themselves as indigenous and, and share their stories and, and make it, it seems like it's becoming more of a welcoming um, environment for people to self-identify and, and know that this is the space for them and support them. So uh, again, uh, my condolences and I know it's a time of mourning, but I do hope that we can look for the light and the way forward. Thank you, Greg. Um, June 17th, at 5.30 p.m., we will be um, having an event for the Indigenous History Month. Um, that email has already gone out, so please do register for that. And then we can definitely talk about like next steps and action items in that uh, meeting also. Um, I think like if there are allies that were wondering like what you can do and all of those thoughts are going through your mind. Um, I think just kind of being mindful of like letting the community mourn and taking that time. Um, and we're because we're not emotionally attached to that. So and then like removing ourselves from it and then thinking about like the action items with like others that who are 
able to think about that, right? So just being mindful of those things because um, instead of like when we hear a news, this happens like anytime when a racialized community goes through something, we all like bombard that people from that community and just kind of start asking, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? It's, it comes back about us, right? Like it's about us. And then so it's not about us at this at this moment. Um, and also for allies to think about doing things that will make you uncomfortable. Like, you know, a lot of the things that you're going to do for Indigenous communities will be seen as illegal or inappropriate by the government. Are you willing to take that chance? Will, are you willing to put your money towards uh, legal fees for the individuals who get arrested for, for, land, for land defenders, right? Or will you look at them and say, well, they're breaking the law so that they're getting arrested, right? No, they're not. They're defending their land and they're telling the colonizer to stop taking their land. So what are you willing to do as an ally? Only what the government allows you to do? Or are you willing to challenge your government that continues this genocide? So I think that's a, a ref self-reflection question that you would have to ask yourself, what length and how far will you go to stand with the indigenous communities? Anyone else? I'm sure like you guys would have seen in the news uh, that the Vatican has is not releasing the information about the residential schools and the feds have deleted them and everybody's pointing at each other asking for an apology, but they continue to keep putting this community through trauma, right? So you, as, as settlers that if your ancestors have been part of colonization, I think it's time to acknowledge that and say that as a settler, my ancestors, my grandparents or whoever were part of this, but I'm trying to do, make this right and I will challenge this process, right? Like, I think that's a really good place to start. And if you're having uncomfortable, if you're feeling uncomfortable saying that maybe kind of going back to seeing your roots and where your ancestors came from, which land was taken and how that land was passed on to you through generational wealth. And how do you continue to benefit from that? Like these are good things to kind of start bringing up and, uh, and, and calling yourself as a settler and then acknowledging that part. So then we give the ownership back to the indigenous people. Uh, Catherine? Oh, um, it was just, just a couple of things. I think one of the, I, I attended another vigil in Hamilton and I think one of the interesting things like as, as sad um, as these events are was there was, there was really a focus at that vigil to actually focus on like feeling joy as well. This is what was robbed of these children. And so I actually found that really like refreshing is that it is actually also revolutionary to um, try to turn around like this, this like, it is extremely sad, but also to like feel the joy that these children were never able to feel, right? I found that to be very interesting perspective because I know this like feels like an extremely heavy and sad moment right now. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is, is I think like, just like as difficult as it is, like sitting with this and, and like Jeannie was saying, allowing the communities to like regroup and, um, I can't, I can't hear Catherine. Can you guys hear her? Okay. I think it's fine. So go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, just like not feeling like we need to figure out something that we need to do right now immediately. This is a longer term commitment, right? And just allowing some space for people to breathe, come to terms with, regroup as communities and, and just continuously listening to what indigenous communities are asking for and thinking about how we can support that. Um, so just like giving it some time, I think too, is, is important to, to acknowledge. So that was the only other thing I wanted to add, but like, just be really nice to hear from other folks that maybe we don't hear from if, if anybody wanted to, to share something. I know we're coming up on an hour, so. And just like, thank you everybody for, for being here. So we'll be wrapping up in two minutes. Um, you're more than welcome to say, we'll, we will leave the room open um, just for people that who want to stay back and just uh, talk or 
share and Remember me, remember me, when the sun comes up in the morning sky, there I will be, there I will be, so ring with the eagle so high, Remember me, down low, hand in hand, you and me. one o'clock the vigil has come to an end the room will still be open for another few minutes for anyone who wants to stay um, but others can leave no problem at all thank you for attending the vigil the room will remain open for another few minutes if anyone wants to stay back and talk Down the road,